right, I think that's okay. The mic's on now, All right? So we're
So the question, all the other questions that were asked, I'm looking at the camera now, all the other questions that were asked so far, meaningless. You didn't need to hear this. The question that this young gentleman just asked is, um, where does all the magic happen that allows, in normal streaming replication, there's like SSH keys and all this other stuff that happens. How is that happening here? And that's why I said OpenShift doesn't know any of that. That's not part of the OpenShift part. OpenShift just knows how to spin up the replicas. It's the Docker image builder, Jeff, who made it so that when they spin up, they could do this kind of stuff. So yeah. now, Jeff. <clears throat> yeah, this, this is really simple in that there's no SSH key generation required for this type of Postgres streaming replication. The only thing, because it's using just the, the Postgres protocol, uh, so what happens is when a slave uh, connects to the master, uh, it's before it, that happens, all I do is execute PG base backup to create that, that replica for that slave container. And then at that point, just start up Postgres and it's, it's in a replication mode. The master is doing a protocol with that slave to establish that replication protocol. So there's no SSH key generation um, required in these, in these examples. So maybe a So the question yeah. was, maybe, maybe this is ignorance on my part. I got to get that part in, just because it's important. But so there's no encryption between the master and the replica in yeah. this case. And then we, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff said no, but then Josh looks concerned about that statement. You're not using an SSL connection? There is not an SSL connection between the slave and the master. I'm just using a straight SQL connection. Yep. It's easy to fix. It is not currently doing that, but as soon as Jeff leaves here, he promises me that he will make a new Docker container. No, it I, sounds like it's an easy fix. You would basically just have to put the certs on the different machines, yeah, right? In the I, Docker image itself. I believe Postgres gives you that option, uh, but I didn't choose to do that with this example. But the way I would fix it is I would go into the Bash script uh, in that container, and whenever it goes to set up the connection, that's the point where I could. Uh, tweak the configuration of the replication. Uh, by default as well, this is using asynchronous replication instead of synchronous. So those kinds of configuration changes um, are possible either by tweaking the way I did the bash script or I give you another avenue with this in that I let you mount a local volume that contains your own Postgres dot conf and PGA HBA comp files that are local. So you can even override the entire Postgres configuration using a set of external files. And that's just a Docker volume, a config volume that I'll let you, you have the option. You can either mount that and put something in it. And if something's in there, it'll use that. Otherwise, it'll use the one that it gets pre-generated. The environment variables that Steve pointed out are another way of you tweaking the configuration um, that is generated by default. Um, but you have the option to completely override the, the Postgres configuration using your own local config files. So maybe you'll cover this, but I'm just wondering if there's like an open shift way. Like obviously, because this image is immutable and often public, you don't want to make your search. Yeah. It's not public. By default, we d the only traffic we route is HTTP traffic. Well, sometimes you would, you would go get yeah. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Typically, you would mount the certi any kind of certificate store as a Docker volume so that you've externalized all those keys. And we also have one of the volume types that we've also put in, it's an OpenShift, it'll probably get pushed back up into Kubernetes soon enough, is a secret volume. Right, so you can mount that volume. Everybody can make a claim to that volume and get those secrets inside. It's a separate volume claim. So we have that as well. I in know there. your secrets. What? I know your secrets. You know our secrets now? Yeah, there's probably... You have to leave now, sir. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Just kidding. So it, he said something that was inconsequential. Me. I know you couldn't hear it, but it was... He, the young gentleman here was also making a suggestion about how we might want to tweak it so that it was, the path was an environment variable rather than hard-coded in the image. Yeah. Uh, I want to keep going. I don't know where we are on time. Oh, we have a half hour. Well, that's still a lot of time. We're good. Um, you are, so now, this young gentleman in the front, you couldn't hear because I didn't repeat it, asked... What happens when you scale up to three? Funny you should ask that question. Let's do that. So let's go back 
to the pods? No? I want to go back all the way up. What happened to the screen? Did, oh, I, you know why? Because I, I increased the font to, so that you can see that. There we go. Overview. Ready? Here's how hard it is to scale up to three read replicas. So what we're probably waiting for here is these are Docker images. So what has to happen is we have a master, and then we have a bunch of nodes that actually run the Docker images. If that node has not pulled that Docker image down already, it's got to pull down that Docker image and then spin it up. So we're already at two reps pods running, I think. Or did I just go to two? Or did I not go to three? Okay, there we go. So now I've got to wait for it to scale to three. And so that's what we're waiting for right there. We're waiting for... Uh-oh. The object has been modified. <coughs> oh, there, two. I've never seen that error before. Close. Welcome to live demo. I know, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, is there any way in public open shift to ensure that my replicas end up on different physical hosts? Yes. So the question was, is there a way that I can actually make sure that my replicas end up on there? Now we have three pods running. So that's all it took to get your three running. We'll do the data in a bit. But I'll answer your question in a second. Josh, just let me, I just want to show one thing. Here's the two that just spun up. They take, it, we have to now spin up Postgres, right? So I want to show the logs while it's going, right? So that way, because I can't do the, I can't show that it's replicated yet until that actually finishes. The question that Josh asked again was, is there any way to make sure that they end up on different hosts? And yeah, that actually can be controlled through, um, through your deployment. Actually through the cluster admin, they can set policies for how the deployment of Docker images happens or how the deployment of containers happens. So you can do things, it's actually a set of rules. You can have it as simple as disaffinity. I want you always to pick one that doesn't have one on it already. So when it goes through all the nodes to say, where should I, this is the scheduling part that we talked about, that Docker doesn't handle by itself. So you say, oh, I want those three replicas. Okay, I've got four nodes. This one's already got a master, or this one already has a slave. Where am I gonna spin up the next one? One of those other three. I've already spun up the second replica. I'm gonna spin, where, I wanna put up the third now. Where am I gonna put it? I have to put it on one of the other ones that don't have it. So that's a simple disaffinity rule, but you can also set things like, but I all want them to be in the same data center, right? Or I want them all to be in ge different geographic data centers. So do a disaffinity rule for data centers. You can also say, I want the one that is not on the same host that has the least amount of CPU and the most amount of memory. So it'll go through and start finding nodes and then do rules based on that. So it should be up now, right? Did we watch it do it? Yeah. So now I'm on another one of the, the new ones. Here I am again. That. Can you see that in the back? Once I get to it? Yep. There. Right. And hold on a second. Just to show that they're actually really talking to each other. Here's the master again. Here's where I copy and paste again. now? Oh, does copy and paste not work here? Is it control shift V here too? No. I, I thought, oh no, I didn't. Let me try one more time. Nope. Okay. You guys get to watch me write SQL on the fly.
Thank, thank you, pair programming. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even sit next to you, but that's the best part. There, done. So that I inserted it into the master. Now this is the part where Jeff gets nervous. <laughs> what? Backspace, 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 all the way. Table, space, test, enter. Semicolon enter, yeah. I think you're so smart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There. So that's on the, that happens. So that's all set up in live. So now I have. So what? Okay, that's enough giving him attention. Don't reward him for his insubordination. Okay. So if I go back to this again, right, and make this smaller. So I think. Wait, wait, first off, this is where I think. Did I make, not make it small enough? One more. There we go. One of the things I really want to point out again here is. I would never be able to do this if I was trying to explore. I might be able to do this after like five days worth of gap shaving, and I'm sure I would set it up wrong, and I would probably give up in the end, because I'm not going to spend five, does everybody know what I mean when I say gap shaving? This is a Linux conference. Come on, really? Okay, well that's right, I think I'm on a BSD list, I think. But the, gap shaving is the idea, I'm going to do that now for everybody since we have time. Gap shaving is the idea that you want to check your mail at the end of your, your 100 yard driveway, and it's the winter in Manitoba. So it's freezing outside. So you're like, oh, I better put a sweater on before I go get my mail. Oh, I don't have a sweater. Okay, I guess I gotta get a sweater. Oh, I have, can't go to the store, I gotta make a sweater. Do I have any yarn to make a sweater? No, I guess I better go spin some yarn. Do I have any wool? No, I don't have any wool. So I, guess I, get, guess I better go get some wool. Okay, I better go outside and shave my yak. And so you spend the whole day shaving your yak and you still haven't gotten your mail. Right? Which is a typical problem for developers a lot. Right? I really just want to write an app that has a database and a web tier, and I want the database tier to be replicated. Okay, well, spend five days setting up a Linux VM, and then you're going to start playing around with first installing Postgres, and then you're going to play around with how you're going to... And if you're five days later, you're frustrated, and your boss is coming to you and saying, where's that project I wanted? And you're like, well, I'm still monkeying around with Postgres files. And that's when they say, use, use Microsoft SQL Server because I don't want you spending all this time monkeying around with config files. And then you're sad, <laughs> and then you put your job. Or you become out of <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you created the other uh, replicas, yes. did it copy the data from the first replica or from the master? So the question was, when it created the other replicas, did it copy the data from the other, from the master or the first replica? Oh, or from the first replica. No, this is typical like master, master replica replication where the new replica comes online, it checks in with the master and it says, where should I be? And then it proceeds to read from the master and make itself like the master. Is that correct? That was just a fact check from the, the guy who asked me that. I like that. Yes. What? My SQL doesn't do that. We're not going to get into that other inferior database that begins with a <laughs> line and ends with a SQL. We're not even going to mention that on whole. That's a great project. I just, I don't understand. I've been a PostgreSQL user for 10 years now, and I understood why people use MySQL because it was really easy to set up. This is not Red Hat Steep at all. This is off myself because I wasn't even. But I just never saw a reason to use it, personally. I, it just never. I wanted. Rep I wanted. He, I wanted um, I wanted transactions and I wanted stored procedures and I wanted triggers and I wasn't willing to give that up and it was never that much slower that I needed to give it. Up. <laughs> I'm not Google scale or whatever scale everybody thinks they need to be at. Yeah, you had a question. Um, in this scenario, bad thing, <laughs> right? Or it fails for a short amount of time. Say, network disconnection. There's a network disconnection. Nothing like that ever happens in the real world. So the question was, what happens if the master fails, right, or the master gets disconnected? Jeff? Yeah, right now there's no automatic failover happening for you. You're going to have to, as a DBA, you're going to have to get in and trigger failover Wait, to one of those Wait, but the slides. master would respin itself back up. Yeah, if, well, that's true. Uh, so if OpenShift can see that it's down, because there's lots of different... We used to say going down, and that used to mean something very particular, like about what it meant that the database was down. But there's actually lots of different states of down, right? So if the OpenShift cluster or the Kubernetes cluster can't see, if that replication controller says, there's supposed to be one of these, and it's not up, it will spin up a new, it will spin up a new one if it can't see it at all. 
We also have liveness checks, like a ready check. I don't know if you've defined, did, did you define one? No. Yeah, OpenShift actually has the ability to say, hey, I know you're up, the container's actually running, but are you actually working? So you can define a probe that the cluster will keep hitting and saying, is it working, is it working? If it's not working, it'll spin up a new one and bring down the old one. But I don't know if, if the, what will happen in terms of, if I bring up a new master with no data in it, I, what I'm assuming is going to happen, because we're, this is the problem with using an empty directory. Right, there'll be no data. If we were using some other data directory as the PGSQL data, it could come up and then say, oh. Sorry? Yeah, and then you wipe out all your data. So that, that, this, is not a, this is not a production setup here for anything that actually matters. Hold on. Wait, wait one second. One second. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, I will be talking on Sunday about automatic failover. Okay. So on Sunday, Josh will be talking about automatic failover with containers? Uh, yeah. Oh, with containers. So, yeah. Jeff should attend so that I can give a better talk next time. Yep. I blame Jeff that I couldn't answer that. Yep. One, one thing. This, that's a great question. Best question of the day in that the, it depends on how the master fails. If the node or the physical server that you've deployed the node to, let's just say, goes up in flames, at that point, you need to have made sure that your slaves or your replicas are running on separate physical host, and you're going to have to make a decision. Um, can I restore that server? If so, Kubernetes, when you start Kubernetes back up, it'll restart, try to restart the master, and things will come back. But if the server that that's on just completely is toast, then you probably will want to trigger a, a, a one of the slaves to become the new master. Um, you're going to have to do that manually currently with the way these containers were, are constructed today. So you as the DBA would have to say, okay, I want that one to become the new master. Or you're going to have to go to a backup, create a new node somewhere else on another server and call that one the master. But when you do, you're going to have to reconfigure your, this cluster all pretty manually at this point. I'll show you another project here soon that does this for you. Uh, to a certain degree, but that's a great question, and it's one of the downsides to using the empty dir volume type, okay? Because it sets on that physical server, and that that empty dir volume is managed and provisioned by OpenShift on that server. The upside is high performance; you directly are accessing local disk. If I make uh, the choice or the decision to deploy all of this on, say, NFS volumes then all of my Postgres performance uh, deals with the latency or whatever of that network storage. So that's the architectural quandary or decision that you need to make when you deploy this is, uh, am I deploying for ultimate I.O. performance? If so, I'm probably going to use empty dir and deal with if I lose a, vo uh, lose a server, here's my, here's my procedures to reinitialize this cluster somewhere else. Or if performance is acceptable using whatever network volume type that Kubernetes supports, whether it's Amazon or, or uh, Google Cloud Storage, those are both options, then you probably would go there because now you have the ability, to, you know, you have a lot more resiliency. So that's a great question and it's one where you know, when I was writing these containers, I can't answer that question architecturally for everybody because everybody in this room has a different problem they're trying to solve. But I did want to make sure that I could make the empty dir volumes work because I know a lot of people are going to say, man, I've got to have ultimate I.O. performance. So um, as tempting as it is to just say, I don't always use NFS and not have to deal with that problem, a lot of the, the thinking, at least in this project and another one here, I'll just briefly introduce to you, it's using empty dir for a reason, and that's to give you the highest I.O. bandwidth performance. And it's not a simple one either. The other thing that Jeff was talking about, well, like when he said configuring it so the others become the master, OpenShift and Kubernetes, as soon as that pod dies, because the replication controller says there should be one of these running, it's going to spin up a new master right away. Right? And I'm assuming that the replicas will try to reconnect to that new master that just came up, and it'll say, I have no data. Make yourself like me. And you're going to wipe out all your data. So it's, this is not the 
I'm not showing the like, <coughs> ultimate pr production scenario right here, but I'm trying to show something that I don't think any of us, most of you have probably never seen before, right? And some of the advantages to using this kind of work architecture. More work would have to go in, like, uh, and you could engage the crunchy people and engage the OpenShift people to figure out a better way to do that. Wait, there was a question in the back, and then I'll get to you. Is it going to happen? No, the pod will be completely different names. But what, but the, what will stay the same is the service name. And that's why, the, that's why the replicas are actually reading through the service rather than directly to the pod. Right? So it will work because it's going to talk to the service. And because you put the service in front, it doesn't care which, what's the actual pod name behind it. Does that make sense? What? Yeah, every, every, How did you trick that? Yeah, everything goes uses the service name, and the service name is the IP entry point that everything can find everything through. So a pod, in this case, whenever I create the replica, I'm passing in the master service name. And if you look inside the pod... I'm going to show them right now. Okay. Docker so, will actually always associate or give you a service name to IP um, translation. Actually, it's Kubernetes that does it. Kubernetes. So Kubernetes and OpenShift insert, um, so it's going to be Postgres, right? Or is it going to be master? Well, just uh, cat out Etsy host, and you'll see something interesting there, too. But that's a, that's a good example there. Of right. Where so I'm, in now in the, I'm in one of the replicas, right? And I probably have to make this bigger. Come on. Can you see it? It's fine? Okay. So um, this, when he said it, the, the, the slave is actually probably using that environment variable to get the IP address of the, oh no, is that, yeah, to get the IP address of the master, rather than hard coding in, right? Is that, am I right? It's, uh, it's using PG master host and PG as master the connection. Yeah, it's yeah, it's two down. Two down, yeah. this one? Yeah, it's using that. And you're like, okay, how does that get resolved? PG Master, and yeah, so cat out Etsy host. No. Host, sorry. I nearly had a heart attack on that one. But you're like, what? I'm just yeah. made a fool of. <laughs> you see so, down there? Well, I'm not seeing what I was expecting to see there, but anyway, the. Kubernetes in this case, I keep forgetting what it's doing for me versus Docker, but Kubernetes is actually... Um, oh no, Kubernetes, this service, that, right in that service, the, that actually maps to the IP address. Yeah, and it's getting resolved. That IP address <laughs> is actually getting resolved by Kubernetes. But I'm referring to that as, a, as the connection host name. So the reason I, this is, if I had gone more into the whole OpenShift thing, Back in that slide with the gold and blue, one of the hard parts about setting up Kubernetes is it doesn't include a networking layer. It expects you to bring a networking layer. We, OpenShift actually brings a whole software to find network. And it's got, and OpenShift runs its, and runs its own internal DNS to do that kind of stuff. So it's doing it all under the hood. So but in the scenario where the master dies, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be, the slaves aren't gonna reread that. The service stays consistent. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right? That, remember what I said, that IP address for the service never ever changes okay. unless you delete it and bring it back. But service IPs never change, and which is why you're talking to the service, not directly to the master. All the, you're talking to the service, under the hood, OpenShift knows and Kubernetes knows to reroute that to the pod that is actually the master. Okay. Right? But the IP for the service has never changed. That's the benefit of this framework. Right. Your end pieces don't have to care about pods coming up and down. <laughs> and the drawback in this case is we end up wiping out the entire data. Steve might have mentioned it, but the service name for the slaves is actually a proxy, so it just has, implements a simple round robin. So your app, when it connects to that service uh, and does a request, um, it actually just does a round robin against however many slaves you have. Uh, that's the other Which is a point. good point. So this is the last part of the demo I want to talk about because I want Jeff to show off his stuff as well. But 
go smaller. Thank you. So this is for the app developers or even for the sysadmins, who, the DB admins who talk to their developers, which is a few of you. Um, th what is the other nice part about this architecture is, the remember when we talked about the web here talking to this? Oh, you, I promised you an answer to a question. Sorry, you have to wait about the nice part. You're going to miss the nice part now. Oh, go ahead. Taunt them too. Go ahead. So in this configuration, if you did a manual failover, there's no way to get the slave, this new master, which was the former slave, into the PG master pod. It is. Uh huh. So this is a whole Kubernetes thing. We need like a whole. So the question was, how could I, if I bring up one of, if I promote one of the one of the replicas to master, how do I get that to respond to the service? that is actually the master service. Kubernetes uses labels for everything, right? So if you, look at, if you look at the service right here, I'll click on the service, and if we look at the selector, the selector for that service says, where the name equals pgmaster.rc, right? So the service knows what to route to based on that selector. So anything that says name equals to pgmaster.rc, that service will then start routing to that pod. So all you would have to do is, man and you can do this uh, in the version that I'm showing here, you just do OC edit, and you can edit labels. But if you go back and you look at your pods here, these three pods, if I click on these, let's see if it shows me the labels right here. Uh, where's its labels? You see, nope, they must be under annotations? Maybe. No. Where's the label? <laughs> All right, let me, uh, I, I can't see it through the, oh, there. There's the label. Sorry. It's the new web configuration. The labels are actually all in blue on the top. So this one has the name um, PG Slave RC. All you have to do is add that label to PG Master RC, and automatically that service will start routing to that traffic. You can manually edit it and do it. Without restarting the container, without doing anything else, you can just change traffic around by changing labels. So that's one of the other great benefits of this kind of architecture. Does everybody understand that? So that's the other. And, or, let's say you have a misbehaving slave. It's working, but you're throwing a bunch of errors, and you go to the terminal, you see all these errors. So Kubernetes doesn't want to, OpenShift doesn't want to kill it. But you want to, and you don't want to delete it because you want to look at what went wrong. You can just change the label from PG Slave RC to PG Slave RC busted, and what will happen is the replication controller will say, "Oh, I don't have three of those. I only have two. I'll spin up a new one." And the service will say, "Oh, I don't want to route to this because it's not the right name, but it'll still be up there and running and not dead." So you can go and do all the diagnostics. If you fix it, you can just change labels and do back again if you want. And okay, so the cool thing, right? I was showing the cool thing. Is that what I was doing? It's not actually even a cool thing to show, it's just something that naturally happens. <clears throat> when you're writing your application, it's very easy now when you're doing, if your application is doing right, the only service it talks to is PGMaster RC. Right? I didn't have to do any weird configurations. I don't have to tell my programmers anything different. I'm like, this is your right service, and this is your read service. Right? All the reads should happen off the, off, off the PG Slave RC. You don't have to tell them to do. It's like for me as a developer, that's such an easier way to think of what I'm doing. Oh, I want to read from the slaves and I want to write to the master. So those are the things I write to, and I don't have to worry about anything changing under the hood or how many replicas are up or anything like that. I know PG Pool can take care of a lot of that stuff, but here, if I'm just using, even if they don't, if you choose not to use it, it's there, and I don't have to care how many replicas are behind it, and I don't have to make my master do any reads at all. So my master can just handle writes exclusively. Which is the preferred architecture, right? Yeah? Yeah? So it's just out of the box we get that preferred architecture. And we get it easy for the programmer to know how to work with that preferred architecture. So. Down to what? Why done. didn't you warn me? Hi, man. You were on a roll. So you were covering everything I was going to talk about anyway. So. Uh, no, seriously. Two minutes, we're done. I'll just mention a few more things. Go. I'm about right. two weeks out from having a PG pool container that will work with this, by the way. Um, pulling that from this other project called Crunchy Postgres Manager. Um, 
So probably in about a two week time frame, you'll have a PG pool container that will go along with this. So the idea there is you would deploy that into this environment. It'll know who the master service is, the slave service, and it'll configure PG pool for you so that it'll do smart load balancing. So your apps at that point would have one entry point instead of two. Um, and that's going to actually uh, be pretty useful for people. Also backup and restore capabilities. Uh, people have asked about that. And that's probably another one where I'm pulling from another Docker project, again, uh, the CPM project, a backup and restore. And it's uh, just a simplistic backup and store where you can run backup on this and it'll create a network volume that will contain that, that backup. And I have to use a network volume in that case because you want your backups to be kind of long living and whatnot. And you can deal with any kind of slowness to using network storage in that case. The restore will work and, and basically it'll fire up this crunchy PG container. It'll look for some restore flags and also uh, which restore archive you want to build your new container upon and it'll basically pull down that archive to the local empty dir storage and it'll start up Postgres using that. And that's another feature, a uh, couple of containers that you'll see on this uh, on this uh, GitHub project pretty soon. And those are just what I would call basic features to get started, um, allowing for uh, a sim simple failover is definitely something that I've been thinking about how to do, like maybe exposing a, a trigger file location via Docker volume so that you could trigger it that way, and maybe some utilities that would help with managing some of the state. Um, some other points is this runs on CentOS and RHEL at currently, so it's up to you which one you want to use. I supply Docker files to both. It bases, uh, it uses the RPMs from the PGDG repo currently to do all of this. Uh, it's, it's where it gets its Postgres bits from currently. Um, Crunchy itself has our own repo that we're looking at maybe offering that version up as well for a a more secure or supported version of Postgres as well. So you could run these containers using that, say, in an enterprise um, scenario where you needed support. Other things is the, I put in here PostGIS and PG routing by default. So the size of this container is pretty hefty by Docker container <laughs> image sizes. But the reason is there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that I just said, let me throw it in there and if people need it, great, it's there. Uh, and if not, they can pair that out just by chopping it out of the Docker file if you wanted to shrink down that image size. But I've not found where the image size between 300 meg and 500 meg really matters for, for anything I've noticed. Um, what else was there? Uh, I could talk probably for an hour just on the Postgres UID and GID configuration settings in OpenShift. The bottom line is Postgres uh, needs and requires to run as the Postgres user. Out of the box, OpenShift uh, generates random numbers for your UID. Well, that's a problem if you just start this container up. It will die. Postgres will die and saying, hey, I'm not, I need a Postgres UID to run under. I can't run under some dynamically generated number. So there's different strategies for that, and that's the security measure that's in OpenShift. But there's configurations in OpenShift that allow you to totally change that behavior. And you can say, no, OpenShift, run all of these containers as any user. You'll see in the Docker file I wrote where I specified the Postgres user to run this under. And also in the Docker file, you'll notice that Postgres is the, the last thing that runs, and it runs in the foreground, so it hangs there. And the reason for that is if it ever dies, Kubernetes will know that the entire pod has died and per try to perform a restart, okay? And that's a, a just another thing that you'll notice if you look in detail. Um, Quick question. Yep. Uh, I'm just wondering, does Postgres run as PID 1? Not in this example. Okay, so what I do is I start up a bash script and it called, I think, start.sh. In there, it eventually makes its way down. So if you look, PID1 is actually that bash script. Okay. Now, some Postgres examples will 
uh, not work that way at all. But I'm still using a bash script in this example to set up some of these configuration options. And then the very last thing, the hanging process, essentially Postgres, that keeps that script alive so it won't exit. Um, don't have time today, but there's a whole other project here. There's a couple of parallel tracks at Crunchy in terms of Docker work. This has certainly been a big one. We wanted to make it a way for people to run Postgres in an OpenShift uh, container world, Kubernetes world. But there's a whole other project I did called CPM or Crunchy Postgres Manager that has web UI. It's Docker only. So it does its own level of orchestration and it's for people that want to implement a purely on-premise uh, Postgres as a service. But it uses Docker Swarm and it's uh, using Docker um, volume plugins and things like that to perform sort of how what you saw today except through a point and click web UI. And there's certain things I can do in that environment because I can control the entire host topology that I can't do in, a, in an open ship. So I encourage you to look at that project as well. Uh, in that one, for instance, I can do a backup and restore uh, just point and click. Uh, and I can also do restores from things like PG Base Backup. I can run PG Badger uh, uh, on any container. Um, I can start up a predefined profile of clustering. And then I also built in there uh, Postgres metrics collection using Prometheus. So it includes a whole lot of enterprise functionality um, as well. And so it's we have a slide on it with the link to the Git repo as well. Yeah. It's in there. So just to wrap up, we're, done. we're in a time of container explosion. The take home I give to the Postgres maintainers right now, except for Jeff because he already knows this. If you don't know this already, some of the ways that Postgres does things were great back when Postgres was first built. It is not so good anymore in the world that we live in with containers. So it would be nice if we started to think about moving Postgres to being friendlier to containers and stop thinking that everybody's standing it up the way they used to stand it up before. I had a big argument with, uh, wasn't with the actual person, but like extensions. Please stop forcing it to be a root user or the Postgres user to install extensions. That is not the world we live in anymore in the, in the cloud and container world. I don't need to be root or Postgres anymore to install an extension and still be secure from a, an administrator standard. The, the world is changing and some of the ways that Postgres needs to change has to come along with that. And I get to say that now because I got the soap Um Kubernetes and OpenShift gets you beyond containers. Good times are ahead for you with containers and Postgres. Upstream first. so. All the stuff that you're seeing is upstream both from Jeff's work and Open, uh, Red Hat's work. It's all done in open source first, and you have access to it right now to play with it. Um, reach out to me on Twitter or any of the other places where you can reach to Steve-O, even at redhat.com. You can't talk to Jeff because he refuses to use any electronic media. Um, and that's it. Thanks, everybody.